Hey, a pleasant good day, everybody. This is our latest edition of Sports Fanatic News Hockey Show as we're here to talk about the Minnesota Wild as our next 2021-22 team check-in. As I'm here with Frederick Helmer Franzen, I think I pronounced that right. <laughs> pretty good, pretty good. Um, but yeah, th- thank you so much for having me on. Um, pleasure being here. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome to have you on. Uh, Frederick's joining us from uh, Denmark, by the way, so... Uh, we're having the we're trying to test our connections here with Skype from a very far ways away. So we're daring, <laughs> we're daring to do that as well. But before uh, we go into breaking down the entire team, we'll go with the standings first. Where the Wild are a little bit behind. Obviously, the Avalanche are just forget the Avalanche. The Avalanche are above everybody. But the Wild are a little bit behind the St. Louis Blues. Um, the Blues are 19-6-2 and two at home, 12-8-4 on the road. The Wild have 15 wins on the road at 15-12-2 and two to 16-4-1 one at home. What would you say as we look at the standings is the first question coming in. Your Wild also 4-6 and six in the last 10-6-3 and six, three and one of the Blues in the last 10. Of their chances of catching the Blues compared to staying um, in that fourth spot or, or in that third spot, excuse me. Or. I, I feel like the Wild is... It's pretty safe to be a playoff team. Um, I think when you look at recency, obviously they lost the last three games. They have lost, I think, only won one in like five games. So it's not been great stretches. But at the same time, they also played Toronto, uh, Calgary last and Winnipeg twice. So, so it, it isn't the easiest stretches. I know Winnipeg has been been weirdly uh, uh, streaky this season and hasn't played well, but apparently against the Wild, they have been able to both games play extremely well played games. Um, and again, it's the Wild. If you look at the thing you mentioned it before, how many of the games has been away games so far this season? They have a lot of home games coming up. Um, they have played what is it like um, twenty one games at, at home. Oh, so they have a lot They're of only math. 16 4 and 1 at home and 15 yeah. 12 and 2 on the road. So, yeah, significantly more on the road. So, there's going to be a lot more home games during this last stretch, which is going to be very compact. I think for most of the league, it's going to be fairly compact. And the Wild is one of the teams where it's like they play some of the least amounts of game. Um, so, I'm not too worried about the Wild losing out on places. I think they can even overtake the Blues. Um, but again, I think a series between the Wild and Blues is probably on the cards, and I would say that's even with home field advantage, I don't think that matters too much because those teams are playing each other very evenly. I would say. Um, so I yeah, don't think. yeah, I think um, what you said about this rough stretches, it, it, it's exactly what it is. Where like I cover the ECHL with the Royals, and they went through a rough patch, and I always say that with good teams, every good team usually has to that's what makes a great team the character buildup of going through rough stretches and then getting past them where that's what all good teams have to go through and that's just currently what the wild are going through they play the uh calgary again on march 1st so you can get revenge against calgary there you got a chance for that then on the third they play um a not so good team in my philadelphia flyers so you should be able to win that game uh it doesn't really matter if that's in philly and then buffalo so those two should help and then Dallas is a pesky team, so Dallas can be annoying to play. And then the Rangers. So there's some games in there, definitely, especially if they can get revenge against Calgary, they could be sitting pretty on a three-game win streak going into playing the Dallas Stars on March 6th. Exactly, and and that's the thing. Like This has been a rough stretch where they've been away for a lot of it and has played good teams over the past bit. Um, and again, it's... The Wilds play frustratingly poorly in a lot of games. I think they have lacked a lot um, in both ends of the ice. Uh, but you mentioned that every team has these stretches. You can't play 80, an 82 game season and expect to win 82 games or play well in 82 games. You will have three games, four games where things just does not work for you um, in a row, and that will always happen. Um, you can miss. You can mention so many teams that has happened to, and it will always be a thing throughout the se- season. Either you start slow, or you have like a middle stretch where you kind of feel like you're you're struggling. And again, yes, there's problems, and it is something that I think Dean Everson said. Like this was the most the loss against Calgary was the most embarrassing loss of the season. That was the most embarrassing game because they didn't compete throughout any of the minutes. And I think that's a wake up call. Like that's a coach that goes, okay, you can have bad stretches. But that was unacceptable. Now we regroup. Now we roll again. Um, so I think that was important to get. 
yeah, I mean, I think the team is pretty well. I mean, like I said before, we, we started kicking off the show. You guys put guys together fairly well via guys you drafted and via also just putting guys into spots that people never thought they would succeed in. Like Ryan Hartman playing center at the NHL level is not something many people had pegged as a thing to have high success with. Where even though he's cooled off and now he's down at, let me get 0.74 points per game, but still a plus 25 and does stuff on the PK and, and when he has to as well. Uh, he's one of those guys that you got on the cheap for years now until the end of 2024 for 1.7. That obviously looks like a one of those just mega genius contracts at this point that that is really going to work out for the while because eventually when you add more center depth, which is something we'll probably get to when we mention the deadline, he will drop down and not play as many minutes, but that's where he should be anyway. So the fact that he stepped up in the role he had to play in, now he'll be put into a role that he's more situated to play in when you do get a set center if you're able to acquire one. Oh, yeah. And again, with the next few years where obviously the Zach Parise and the Ryan Sudok deals are going to come into play, like with the dead cap, that is exactly the contract you need on your team. You need people to step who is willing to step up and can step up into roles. Ryan Hartman has done that perfectly. And for point, uh, seven point uh, or 1.7 per year is one of the best deals in the NHL. And that is exactly how you build a winning team, even though you have have to take some very, very heavy cap hits um, from the dead cap of the two players. They have managed to make a team where I think you said it yourself through drafting, where I think, I don't even think this season is going to be the best season throughout the dead cap era that the Wild is going to face. Probably I, not. No, yeah, I, because I you're think that's actually the guys grow. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's going to be the last year, actually. The last year of the dead cap era, because that's where I think the Wild will have most of their prospects completely ready. I think Marco Rossi will play probably first line minutes with either he will play with Kaprizov and Zuccarello, or he will play with Matt Boldy and Viala or something like that. Something Constellation like that, yeah. is possible. I don't know if Viala is, if the Wild is capable of, of extending Viala. I hope they can. But that's a question mark. Addison's going to be stronger. Lambo's going to be stronger. And most importantly, Jesper Wallstadt is going to be in net. And that, I think, is important for the Wild going forward. So, again, this is a, another... I mentioned this since um, Bill Guerin kind of took over. The Wild has needed transition year and progression years. And this is kind of another step on the ladder. Last year, they made the playoff um, and faced a strong Vegas team to put, put them far into... A round, put him into seven games, really, really fought through it. Yeah, played a great series. Yeah. Really, really, really good series. I think it's one of the best series of the first round, um, but just lost out on on a Patrick Barcaliancro of all people. Like, it's those kind of playoff series where it can turn both ways. A few calls one way in one of the games and it's wild wins, but that's that's how playoff is. That developed them. Them making the playoff again, even if they lose out in the first round, again, it's still progression. I think this learned how to play better, better, better. And yeah, there's a lot of people on this team that's gonna gonna stay for a long time. So it's a it's a good yeah. thing. Yeah, like I think um you have a lot of guys like you were saying that will continue to grow. You answered a question I was gonna ask actually in that process of you explaining that with how you think Ross is gonna play first line minutes because I was gonna ask you what your uh thoughts were on him on a check in on your one of your top prospects, but you already <laughs> answered that. So uh we got that. But I think another guy, um, in terms of locking up people that are good to build around that you guys just recently locked up to um it was twenty twenty, yeah, twenty twenty five for two one is also Jordan Greenway, who's continuing to develop and does really good things on, starting to do really good things with the defensive end and also um, even in the PK role at times. And, it's, and he's one of those guys that uh, it's, I'm going to be interested to see what your opinion is on this, but a lot of people, including myself, still think has more offensive fight in him when you get, when like you were kind of hinting at in your last comments, have guys continue to develop around the team to, become even better playmakers than they are now, if that's either the Connor Duwars of the world, the Brandon Duhames of the world, or the even if he gets some time uh, with Matthew Boldy. Like, he's somebody that maybe over time will continue to grow his offense as now he's already started to really lock in on the other end. He's going to have more freedom to probably grow 
uh, the offensive end, which is what everybody's kind of said, he seems to always have had a little bit more of. Mm -hmm. And again, what the Wild has done is incredibly smart. One of the best lines in the NHL right now, Marcus Foligno, Joel Ehrtsnick, Jordan Greenway. That line is a is a nightmare to face because they are all grinding. They will grind you down, shift after shift, hit you hard, hit you at every time you have the puck, and they will create chances just by pure fortune. And they are such a rough line to handle. And that is a line where the what Bill Garner has done is extend all of them to good contracts. Joel Ehrtsnick has had a great contract where it's like for the next eight years, got a really long extension. He's going to be one of the captain leaders of the locker room, which is great. But it's just those three, they, he has secured that that line stays together for as a probably first line for years now, like the next three years, I think it is. So that is... Yeah, just, Foligno's 2024, so... Yeah, so, so that's that's the thing. And I could see Foligno stay even because he's so such a beloved leader of the team. He's one of the alternates for a very good reason. Like he he's someone who is he is our kind of enforcer or fighter on the team. I know he had probably not the most popular bit due to some of the things he's done this season, has been having to take has made some hits, has made some more dirty stuff. But again, that's sometimes what you need to do as on a team. You have to kind of put yourself into a situation where obviously you can't cheap shot people. Um, but you have to kind of be able to be physical and be a little bit of an annoying pest to play against. And I think Foligno is exactly that. And he is such a hard and soul player. Um, so having that line together is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, Foligno is literally the pure definition of one of those perfect playoff players because he's going to get under the skin. His brother also fits into that category, but, but Marcus even more so is the guy that's going to beat the crap out of you while getting under your skin, where Nick is the great face-off guy, the great PK, or the great, like, yada, 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 in, in other senses, where Marcus is the guy that can get you the 27 to uh, points in 46 games to probably finish the season with 40-something to 50-something if he keeps going where he's going, and also take on anybody he has to to defend his teammate. Nick will do that, but I would say the fighter is more Marcus. I will say this. I think Mark Foligno is one of the most feared fighters in the NHL. I generally don't think a lot of people want to fight him because he isn't the biggest necessarily, but he is fearless. Like there is a reason why the wild fan has a, has his nickname as Moose, um, and he is not someone you want to mess with at all. Yeah, I mean. I think you got like he was a great guy to br bring in from getting him in a trade. Hartman, you got in a trade. Kevin Fial was great guys in trades. Oh, same with Bukestad is a good fourth liner for you in a trade. Not not anything special, but he's fine on your fourth line. Um, that, and, to put a point yeah, into Bukestad, um, to put in a point with Bukestad, with that camp, Bukestad is exactly the player you want. He's cheap. He yeah, does roll mil right, and he yeah. plays on the fourth line. Perfect player. Or 900k, I meant. Yeah, 900k yeah. on the fourth line. Yeah, that. Yeah, that's a perfectly uh, acceptable guy to have there. But then we talked about it, like Kaprizov. Well, one, he was all the way drafted in the fifth round uh, because people never knew if he was going to come over. Eric Sinek was 20th. Uh, you got Boldy at 12 and 19. You got a uh, Duwar who's a 2018 pickup. Brandon Duhame, who is filling his role nicely as well, who's a 2016 pick. And then Brodeen is obviously one of the anchors of the team who's been around for years now. Um, so, and then you sign some good, uh, defensemen and Spurgeon has been around for years and same with, uh, uh, Matthew Dumba, who's banged up right now. And then you sign some good defensemen. Dimitri Kulikov's had a great resurgence with your team. And then Merrill, Jordy Ben's always been one of those good guys to just give 900 K to, because he kind of just fills his role. So if like you were saying in the dead cap era, he kind of is one of those just perfect give 900 K to defensemen. Um, so I think. Like you were saying, Bill Barron really just built this team smartly because he also now has the ability, which is the next thing I want to get to, to go out and get people as we're nearing the trade deadline. If he didn't make these more economic extensions and these more economic moves, because our current GM in Philadelphia screwed him over, uh, then uh, he, he would not be in a situation to be able to make moves at the deadline. Don't you agree? 
Oh yeah, exactly. It's it's being smart, making the right moves, and thinking ahead of time. Like one of the things I've replaced Bill Garen for is he doesn't want just short term, like try and win this year, and then we'll see what happens the other years. No, not have a plan. He has a genuine plan. He has a genuine vision for the team. Um, I think one of the things he said is we are here to win a cup now and the next five years. That is something you want to hear from a GM. And yeah, like he has put himself in a position where the trade deadline. I think he meant in the first season he was there where he really got at a lot of the team. Like got a lot of core, got rid of a lot of players. I think Suka, uh, uh, Jason Sucker went um, and those kind of deals. And he mentioned some seasons you're going to have to be sellers. Others you'll have to be buyers. Right now we're a seller. I can promise you it won't take long until we're a buyer. So, and I think this is one of the seasons where we're probably going to be more of a buyer at the deadline, and it's exciting to to be. Yeah. So, if you had to pinpoint, um, as we look to, um, also the fact that you're twenty percent tied at the twenty percent for the power play, allowed two shorthanded goals in the season, the Wild had to scoring one and seventy eight point seven percent of the PK. With that in mind as well for the trade deadline, if you had to pinpoint either straight line guys you want or just positions you're honing in on that you really want to focus on for the deadline, what would those be? Well, I I know one position that is definitely on everyone's line that has been the entire season. The center depth is not great because we have to, because of the cap space, not call up Rossi, he's going to have to play the AHL season. That's all been the agreement that he plays the AHL season. Uh, the issue with that is exactly that we lack that extra set of depth, which he would normally fill out. I think if Rossi was able to, and um, it didn't have contract issues, I believe he will play in the NHL between Fiala and um, Matt Boldy. I know Freddie um, Godreau has played fantastically over the past a um, little bit and has been really good since football that came up, but I generally think what the Wild want is for him to pl- so have a player play between Baldy and Fiala, so they have a genuine, fantastic second line behind the um, Hartman, uh, Sugarello, and Caprice of line, so they really have that double head of the saw, uh, monster, where they can really throw you underneath. Um, so I think, I know Claude Derue, you probably have a debate on what the price is for him, um, we have um, Joe Pavelski. We have some of those senders um, that obviously would make sense for the Wild to go for um, at probably the cost of a first-round pick and a prospect of some kind. Um, that was obviously the ones that tried to say JT Miller for a time for Fiala and a few other f- pieces. Um, that, I think, has died a little bit. I don't think the Wild need JT Miller the same way as I think Especially not for Kevin Fiala, who has really, really started playing fantastic hockey. So it, it is probably the center position, and Joe Pavelski, Claude Room makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think Claude Giroux to the wild um, would make sense from the perspective of the Flyers, too, because um, I've talked about that from the Flyers side, and you guys do have prospects that. Uh, on top of a pick, obviously, that I think the Flyers would be interested in, uh, where when it came to the teams, because the rumors have always been Colorado, Minnesota, and St. Louis are kind of the top ones with other teams slid in there. Uh, I always thought the ranking went because you guys have really good prospects I'm interested in, but for me, the ranking went Colorado, just because Colorado's loaded with people that should be in the NHL if they were on most other teams they would not be playing in the AHL right now uh, where um, you guys have very good prospects, but they're at the level of where you said they're like a year away from being at the level of where Colorado's are now. So that's why I would rank Colorado one. You're you guys two. And then St. Louis is three because St. Louis is more of those B B plus uh, prospect guyers that um, don't fit into the same category as I think your guys and Colorado. Oh, like if you want to make a deal, I think must you get Jake Neighbors, but that's a completely different conversation. <laughs> I but... think for me, one of the ways you get a deal 
possibly done between like the Wild and Flyers, and you can you can stop me if what I'm saying doesn't make sense. But I think obviously I think the first four this year makes sense too. That obviously has to go up, uh, go into the deal. Um, but I think someone like Adam Beckman could be interesting to throw into the mix. Like those two pieces for Claude Giroux is not terrible. Adam Beckman is a fantastic player. Um, really, really been playing. He's been, he has been playing a weird role in Iowa so far, where he's played on the third line with. He has had the treatment where you are the one star who plays with people who probably are not at your level at all and doesn't quite have the same ability. Yeah, I was him. actually going to ask you about that too because I covered the AHL too, and I noticed the Iowa kind of plays certain guys down the line, similarly to the Phantoms sometimes because of playing veterans up. And I'm always like, but don't you want this guy to develop? Cause he's going to be a future of your NH. <laughs> like, like, like they're kind of similar to the Phantom sometimes where I watch it and go, isn't this backwards? Like, shouldn't this be flipped? Like, shouldn't we have hit? <laughs> like, <laughs> it, it definitely is. But, but I think for, for a player like Adam Batman, I can think I can see some meaning to the madness. I would love to, for him to play with, obviously I would love to him for him and Ross just to play the first lot for first, um, line and just get all the minutes but i think also for like a player like rossi even though he's played first line for like majority of the season like with victor Rask coming in i think it puts some pressure away from him to constantly be the star player on that team and um for a player who had a year off due to injury and really really had um covid um related um issues afterwards um like that whole story is like if it if nobody if someone hasn't read it, please Google it. It's it's terrifying reading, but it's really, really, really um, important, in my opinion, to read. Um, but also Adam Beckman, who has, again, needs time to transition from junior hockey, where he dominates, to suddenly playing against grown-ups and adults and former NHL players. Yeah, it's man. a very, very yeah, exactly. weird transition to make. And he's been playing well. He plays power play minutes. He plays a lot of that. He, he really, really shines on, on his line. But again, it's development that's weird, and I think in Iowa where they try to rotate so all four lines gets as much time as they can. It's, they are trying that as much as possible, but it is true that sometimes you see it like going, why is Beckman so far down? Why is Addison playing third line? Like there's times where that has been completely backwards for me. But again, the, the players who came up like Boldy, they all do the, exactly what they ask when they come up, and I think that's very valuable for the for oh, yeah. sort of ones. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That speaks volumes of what Tim Army's been able to uh, do with Iowa. But but it's more it's more sometimes like when guys came up, like Isaac Rackers come up and had great success, and he was kind of buried for no reason with the Phantom. So I'm not going to question it from that from that, from that perspective. But it, <laughs> it, it, you still, when you're watching the minor league team, go, huh? <laughs> like, like why, why is this like that? But no, I agree. Beckman, I think, should be. Beckman to me is that guy. If like the Flyers ask for two prospects, Beckman's going to be one of them. Where if we ask for one, we're probably asked for like a higher ranked guy, like like one like of your higher ranked process. Where Beckman would be like, we'll want Beckman and say whatever defenseman that you would give us, because the Flyers also need defense. I think that would be the trade because the Flyers. I think Beckman's a perfect developing offensive forward for them that's going to be able to score because they need that desperately too, someone that can just shoot and score. But I also think they would be a team. The problem is all your really young defenders that we can wait to develop are left-handed, and we don't need any more lefties. So, like like O'Rourke, Lambos, and Hunt, even if you would trade one of them to us, are all left-handed. So it's like the, the, the Flyers don't necessarily need that. But somebody that's interesting that you guys picked in this year's past draft that kind of fell in the draft compared to where some had him ranked is right-handed Kyle Masters from Canada. He's mm-hmm. somebody how the Flyers are interested in Hellison, who still has to develop a bit in Colorado system, who just played in the Olympics. I feel like they might be interested in Masters where they're looking at his Adam Beckman's right on the cusp. We're going to get whatever pick you give us in it. And then we're also getting a defenseman who we are hiring new development people. We're bringing in new development people. So I think they're looking at it from that perspective and go, they're going to be able to put him in a better spot to succeed. So when he's ready, we'll have Wyatt Wiley who we're developing now, and Kyle Masters is a good right-handed short defenseman with the other guys we already have. So. I, f- I feel like that's the deal where the if the Wild did that, I could see Wild fan be okay with that as well. Um, I think Wild fan would hate the thought of losing um, Adam Bigman for Rinsel because he is someone that there's a lot of hope for. 
I remember during the like um, preseason games, he was probably the most well. I was saying if we got Beckman, just so you understood what I was saying, I was saying I feel like the Flyers would ask for Beckman if it's for Giroux, especially if Giroux's going to commit to you guys, they would ask for Beckman and Masters in the same trade. Oh yeah, oh yeah, but but I think if you could say that it was Masters and Giroux, uh, Masters and um, sorry Beckman, I think one fan would accept it, but I think they would they would. Losing Beckman is something that I think a lot of Wild fans Wild would would feel a bit mixed about because he's really beloved after that preseason tournament he had where he was he got a Gordie Howe hat trick he was he was legitimately he came out of nowhere everyone was focused on Rossi and Baldy who played fine and it was like everyone was focused on that and then um, Beckman went, stole the show and played probably some of the most impressive I've ever seen a rookie do like he played like a veteran. Um, which was completely out of nowhere. Um, so I think it's someone who, also with in the whole dead cap era, I'm imagining both him and Rossi graduates next year and becomes full time in the Chiellos. Um I think he, they're there at this point where that's where they will be. Adams on the same where he will be a full time in the Chiellos. Like th- those kind of players coming up next season, and then you probably hope for someone like Carson Lambos and and um, maybe a rock or and so on so on kind of develops um 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 another one jake o'brien who jake um mcbain who also played in the olympics and played i know he gave up the puck during sweden's victory over canada during the olympics but it happens. Think, again that's that's a play that sometimes you make and and you can do that 100 times and work 99 Times, but the one time is like in a quarterfinal against Sweden, and you get ridiculed for. Yes, yeah. it's, it's just unfortunate. But he's he's a player who is sneakily good, and it's like I don't think he's on a lot of people's radar. But he I seems like a perfect at least third six three two oh one could skate a bit. Yeah, he it's, fits perfectly into the third line to start, and then try to work your way up from. There, assuming you're not going to start him on the fourth line, but I feel like he has the skill to be on the third line, so you don't have to start him on the fourth line. He reminds oh. me a lot of Nick Sturm in a lot of way. That is kind Nico, of what, yeah. Who, yeah, Nico Sturm, who just goes in and and really just does a perfect job on that fourth you or third line, and just he will do a job. And I think that's where he will probably fit into the Wild plan. And that's the thing: the Wild has a good amount of very sneakily good prospects, and a. I credit a lot of the Wild's success prospect-wise over the recent years in the recent draft, especially to Dude Brackett, who has been coming in from Vancouver, which might be the best train for the Wild has done so far. Taking him from Vancouver, putting him in an amateur scouting, head, head of amateur scouting, has made some fantastic moves. Like, of course, you can blame other teams for letting people like Rossi or Wallstead slide, but even after that, they have made some tremendous picks. Um Who's in the deep enough? Um, Parat was there as well. Um, Lambos. They they have made sneaky good picks that looks to pay off really well. Even Kovanov, uh, Alexander Kovanov doesn't seem like a bad. Uh, give him some time. He's only twenty one year old, um, smaller kid right now. So uh, he doesn't even seem like a bad. You yeah, you guys. I think I think the thing with the Wild is you, you hit it on the head. And then Sam Hedges as well played very well for USA. Oh yeah. Uh, so, like, I think you hit it on the head. They have prospects that don't fall on people's radar beepers. And then a couple of years down the line, you're like, oh, my God, look at how this guy's playing for Iowa. He's about to come up and make an impact for, for Minnesota. And, and that's that's when you know you're great at drafting, when you're able to still pick the Kaprizovs, the Boldies of the world. And also pick guys that nobody notices until two to three years down the line are great and going to make a huge impact at, at, at the NHL um, level. Like, for example, uh, Kosudinov, uh, Maverick Kosudinov, he looks like he's going to be a stud when he's over and eventually playing and is allowed to develop as well. Talk about center depth there. So and when you have him and Rossi in the same lineup doing their playmaking and skating on first and potentially second line, that's not just adding skill. That's adding one of the better probably skating speeds of two centers uh, in the league when both of those guys are over. There. Yeah, and that's a weird thing for me. Like, the Minnesota Wild is two years away from having possibly one of the most scary middles in the 30th team. Yeah. Like, 30th team, but also middles. 
You mentioned it, Rossi. Joel Eriksson Ek, Kusen Zidinov, Arthur Sturm og McBain. That is a scary, scary center there, like where you go, this team is not going to lose that battle down the middle to a lot of teams. Sure, McDavid, of course, he's probably going to be, he's better than Rossi, but then you look down the left rest of the lineup and you're like, well, McDavid can't play in 60 minutes, so even then, I would say Minnesota might have the edge in that regard, and there's not a lot of teams, I think, that can handle that kind of sensitive, personally. So, I'm, I'm, the, the future is very bright for the Wild, and the present is as well, like, but the Wild is a good team, and I, I'm confident with this. Like I, I said before the joke half jokingly, like before the season half jokingly, I thought the Wild would win the Stanley Cup. I, I am still saying the Wild will win the Stanley Cup. They will win against Florida, and they will win six games. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, they're my, uh, they're my dark horse Stanley Cup team. I would rank. Like I will, kind of like how I put Colorado ahead for prospects. They would be a te- They would be probably my first, and then the, the, they're up there. Colorado would probably be the, the the first team. I'll just put it. I'll just put it right. at that for when it comes to the cup, especially if they do make them some of the moves they're rumored to make. Because right now, how we think when all the prospects of the Wild develop are going to be dirty. That's how dirty Colorado is right now with how all their prospects are developed. So that's why I feel like they're at the top for me. And then there's kind of everybody else. <laughs> it's, like, oh. it's like you have them and then everybody else. It's, it's, like, it's like that's kind of how I've been looking at it for cool. for a bit now. Where um, with the Wild, though, somebody I have really liked, because you guys have done this before, whether it's late round scouting great or undrafted, is you guys did pick up because Hunter Jones is developing a little bit slower than you expected. Obviously, you got Wall in that. But you picked up Derek Abarubie, who uh, I've got to watch a couple games in the ECHL and the AHL. And as an undrafted kid out of Canada, uh, he's actually played pretty well for you guys and now played uh, Hunter Jones. Uh, he's had some experience with the Allen Americans, too. And then, but, but like he played for the Ramparts and did pretty good for them in Quebec, in the juniors, in the queue. Uh, he seemed like one of those maybe sneaky – uh, future backup guys to uh, if you eventually say he continues to develop and you have Jesper Wallstead, you're probably not going to need Kapo Kakinen with Jesper Wallstead. Oh. So then Kapo Kakinen probably becomes trade bait to get something else you need at that time. And then maybe if he continues to develop, you slide him in nicely or Hunter Jones, whoever develops at that point as the backup to Jesper Wallstead. And then again, as we just gave Garen credit for this entire podcast, economics. Because that's going to be very good goaltending if those guys develop behind wall step for very cheap prices at the beginning of their run. Exactly, and and it's it seems very clear that Jesper Wallstead next season starts in Iowa like that. Um, Lulio has his the team he's played for in Sweden currently. Um, he's unfortunately injured right now. Has signed a goalie for next season to play behind their other guy. Um, so. It seems very clear that Lulio thinks he's gone. He's going to North America. He's going to play in Iowa. And good. That's exactly what he should. He should play in Iowa. He should start in Iowa. He should get used to North American hockey. That is the next step for him. He is, he is such a dominant goalie. Like, I don't think I don't think I need to mention too much about him. I think people know after that Sweden-Slovakia game where I don't think I've seen a better goalie performance at junior level or any level. Um, and it shows, and he's done that a lot this season in Sweden, where I think it's not just an anomaly. I know goalie prospects, sometimes you have to be careful about how you rate them and who they can fall off and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah yes, but Walsh is not. He is such a good goalie, and he has so much quality to his game. Well, the interesting part is, too, they did reschedule the world, the world juniors, and Jesper was playing in December, so is he going to be if healthy at that point? one of the guys that goes back and joins Team Sweden for the makeup of the World Juniors, and then that'll give him extra play time against the world's best as well. So it'll be interesting to see how that develops because they said they can bring back the same rosters or they can change it. That's what the IIHF already said. What change it is more for people that have to change, like the docs of the world. Like there's certain guys you're not going to be able to bring in because you physically by rule can't bring them into the world juniors at this point because of where they're at in their career. But mm-hmm. like Wallstead could still play. 
Oh, for sure, and and I I I would I think actually think he can, and I and I'm imagining he will. Um, I think he's too good a goalie not to go. Like that's that's as simple as it can be said. I think he's too good a goalie to to not have on your team if you have any expectations to win. You put Jesper Walsen in net, and you expect him to carry the majority of the load. Maybe Kelly Klang will have uh, Pittsburgh Penguins um, prospect. I think um, is going to get like one game throughout the. Uh, Preliminaries, but after that, if a wolf that takes her, takes over, and and he's starting, and I think that is probably gonna be the best goalie of the tournament. Um, I don't, I don't see anyone better. I know Detroit Bain probably want Corsa to be better. I don't think he is. I think he has potential to be good. Nothing against best in Corsa, but wolves that just seemed like the bit like every generation has two or three elite goalies at the same time like there's always those three goalies that are on the same level you have had Brodeur, um Ra, Hasek um then you had Lundqvist still kind of Brodeur, Quick, Price now you have Vasilevsky um um you can say Pecorino was there you can say Saros now um Shesterkin's coming up like yeah. those kind of goalies I think Jesper Volstead, Shesterkin and Spencer Knight is going to be the next three um, where it's like they are going to be the elites of the world. Another guy I've always liked that I would throw into the young goaltender um, studs, especially now since his team is not the best and he's still performing well, I always liked Ottinger in Dallas. I always oh. thought he was one of those. We talked about prospects like you're wild to have a lot of guys that people don't realize how good they are until they're there. <laughs> I always thought he was one of those goaltenders that fit into that category that everyone's talking about everybody else. And then they're not realizing how great this dude's playing for the Texas oh. Stars, and then how great he's coming along, and then he comes up and makes an immediate impact, and then people are still talking about other people. So like, it, I think he's one of those guys that is just going to continue to outshine the amount of people that actually recognize how good how good he is. Where until people eventually say, "Oh my God, this guy actually is really good," which is kind of also what. Since you're Sturkin so good with the Rangers, Sorokin starting to become with the Islanders because the Islanders want that good. But if you look at how he's played, he's really it just he did he wasn't immediate like Sturkin. It took him a year and a half or so to really get adjusted to the NHL. Mm-hmm. But once he did, he's got significantly better each season. Oh, for sure. Like again, th- th- we're in an age where I think the goalies are going to get like there's going to be a lot of goalies who is going to be very very good. But I just think the next generation's like like Vesna competitors almost every year. I think it's gonna be those three, and I think <laughs> the weird thing is, I think the one that everyone thought it would be was the Skarov. I am tentatively kind of cautious with him. Like again, I don't want to call him a bust. I don't think that that's too soon. He can still rebound. He can still become one of the best. But for me. There is the science that I think he has difficulty transitioning from Russian uh, hockey to um, North American hockey and more your different international hockey. So for me, that's kind of interesting to see if, if he can make that transition. If he can and he can turn into what he is has done in the KHL, he's up there as well. Like There is those goalies around, but the Wild definitely got one where I think he is absolutely going to be within that conversation almost like every year. Yeah, I think the young goaltending uh, realm, even with how bad the Flyers have been, one of the guys that have shined through is also our goaltender in Carter Hart. Um, yeah. it, it, and then if Ivan Fedotov comes over, uh, then he, he might have another guy there. So I, I think the young goaltending realm is definitely going to be continue to get better in, in the NHL because it's already loaded where if this was – a while back, Thatcher Demko would also be a guy that was talked about more with how good he's able to play. It's just you have so many guys like the Shostak, as we mentioned, that that are just going to out talk, like be out talked over those guys because they're also in this mega mm-hmm. media market, like Shostak is in New York. Uh, now Jack Campbell came into his own this year, minus last game, but like he's been good this year, and um, he's in Toronto's market. So like all of those guys are going to get. Oh, Markstrom in Calgary. Obviously, like every anybody in those types of markets is going to get more recognition than 
split than the Demkos of the world, the Ottingers of the world, the Spencer Knights of the world. And also, Knight doesn't get enough recognition because he's technically still behind Bob. So, like, that that plays into that factor, I think, with some people, which is no knock on him. It's because you have a guy that one is one is, I think, the only active guy right now to win multiple dozen. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so, like, it, it, it's um, other than no, no, now it's him and Vasilevsky because Vazzy did too. So, it's, but, oh, yeah. so, but, but he, Either way, there's not many goalies that are active that have done that. So, obviously, he might not get immense playing time. But, yeah, I think I, you're spot on. The goaltending is going to be ridiculous. going to continue to be ridiculous because you guys already have Cockin and You're going to add Wallstead into that. And then until Wallstead's fully ready, I think they're keep Cockin Because I'm assuming by the time Wallstead's fully ready, Cam Cowell will probably be moved on if, if Cockin continues to develop elsewhere at that point. And then you're just going to have whoever develops into the backup or side at that point. So I think um, we we pretty much covered it all from your prospects to who you think guys would be good at the trade deadline. We even snuck in some stuff about Claude Giroux, which is perfect since I'm the Flyers guy, so we could talk about that a little bit. I really thank you for uh, joining, the, uh, Frederick. I would love to have you on again sometime, but if you had anywhere you wanted to give out for people to follow you, uh, <laughs> definitely you can do that now. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I really enjoyed it. And just say the word and I will absolutely be on again. Um, but yeah, if you can all find me um, on Twitter, um, if you want to see slightly Danish, sometimes Twitter, but also wild takes and stuff like that, um, you can follow me on um, at Mr. Underscore France um, 2603. Um, and yeah, um, it's been an absolute joy to be, be on here. Um I really thank you for it, and uh, I hope you all enjoyed this. Yeah, I really thank you for being on. You can follow me at JJBoard26 on Twitter and subscribe here at Sports Fanatic News on YouTube, where we cover hockey, football, baseball, and some basketball as well. I thank you all for joining us for the latest hockey show here at Sports Fanatic News. Stay safe out there, everybody, and enjoy the hockey.